Hey guys, how's it going? I am WWE Hall of Famer Lita, welcoming you to General Admission Rattling. You know what I love so much about Cali? The people. They don't roll around in the mud kissing their sister and deep throating their gun like the people out here. Nah, man. California, that's a higher class of person. My people. Champions and celebrities, that's what California is about. I got to this company and people made me think I had to give up all that to appeal to the masses. But I don't give a damn what the masses think of me. Filthy fats living in squalor don't mean nothing to me. I'm Ulysses Sky. I have the respect and admiration of the people that really matter. So the only thing the people in Atlanta have to ask themselves is do they want to get on the right side of history and support Sky? Because my opponents don't stand a chance against me, not even in their wildest dreams. Welcome to GAW Dark here in Atlanta, Georgia. We will begin tonight with Ulysses Sky, the man who returned after a fairly long absence. He returned to the fold to attack Santonico of all people just a couple days ago on Storm Chaser. I can't believe that he even has the guts to show up after doing something like that. He came in, hit Santonico with the low blow, then the sky elbow. This is how it's gonna work here for Ulysses Sky. But he is back wearing the blue and gold of the UCLA Bruins. Sky, a very proud LA native, very proud Californian. And uh, we have seen that from him since he has made his return. Let's see if he's got it in the ring. Let's see if he's improved at all. Since I've had my fix and now I'm fixed on you. Despite your trembling body, I can tell you want it to I'm every minute. I want to say that Sky has improved because the last time we saw him out here, he was losing in a best of seven series, getting swept by Derek Cole. So hopefully, I mean, you're looking for some level of improvement from him, and obviously he's changed his mentality. He's changed something about himself since, we, since he uh, came back. Let's see if that's translated to some excellence in the ring. Meanwhile, Igris, he has been looking for some improvement himself. He knows that he needs to be better. He has fallen all the way to five and 10 after a hot start and challenging midnight for the Raw Championship. So he's expecting more out of himself. Last time we saw him was on Storm Chaser losing to Xavier Cross. So he's expecting more, but he's going up against Ulysses Sky, who obviously is unpredictable, obviously has no morals, and we just have no idea what he's going to be like in the ring. So, you know, who's to say if Igris, I think he has the ability, I think he has the talent to beat anyone out there, but who's to say if he can actually beat Ulysses Sky here tonight? Only time will tell. We'll just have to find that out. Let's see what Ulysses Sky has here against Igris. This is the first time we've seen Sky in any match since before Northern Lights when he lost to Derek Cole in that best of seven series. Nice snapmare from Sky. So here's what we know about Ulysses. He is a terrific striker and a great athlete. And you can see the core strength coming out here against the much younger Igris. Igris called the protege. Well, there's nothing that you can do about the head scissors there from Ulysses Sky. Using the core strength to roll him over. Now Sky going for the arm of Igris. Look at that. Dropping the knee right on the elbow. We know that Sky uses the triangle arm bar. He uses that fairly effectively. Of course, the Sky elbow in his arsenal as well. And now Ulysses Sky putting the boot right to the throat and chest of Igris Sky, loving it. And now first cover of the match here from Ulysses Sky. Igris kicks out. 
You can see Sky has changed his look, and I would dare to say that he's changed his style a little bit here. Going at it a different way against Igris, who answers back with a boot right to the gut. And we know all about Igris, how smart he is. Almost every part of his game is borrowed from the great. And that really, Ulysses Sky takes him down with a cross body. That is also something that Sky can bring to the table. He can be brutal, unleash that striking. Igris is gonna have to find some way to answer, and he does with a snap suplex. All the trainers here in the GAW Academy talk about how smart Igris is, how hard he studies, how much he watches film, but unfortunately for Igris, there's just not much film to watch of Ulysses Sky. There's no film to watch of Ulysses Sky in his uh, in his current state. Igris out of the corner. Igris maybe looking for the iron throne, but Ulysses Sky caught him with a knee to the gut. Igris answers back with a strike, and Igris I think is getting on top here against Ulysses Sky. Out of the way of that boot, and Sky now trying to get an advantage here against Igris. Of course, he got the advantage against Santonico with a low blow, so will he be able to do that this time? Big shot to the jaw. And now Ulysses Sky going up top. Apparently, he's been watching the Usos as well, the tag team champion, superplex to the outside. I don't think a single show goes by where some team or some wrestler doesn't do that at some point. The Usos have taken that move and turned it from a, uh, a dangerous risk to now one of the most well-loved moves in wrestling. Street Cutter from Sky. Sky is dangerous wherever he is. Let's see if he wants to try to keep this on the outside. Igris not going to be around long enough to find out. Back into the ring. Igris now drops Sky down. And Igris looking to get back on top of the great athlete, Ulysses Sky. Igris is going to try to shake up the pace a little bit, and he does. Igris over the top with a backbreaker. He learned that from the current women's world champion, Dakota Kai, leg hooked. And Ulysses Sky kicks out. That's what Igris needed to do. Now Sky to his feet. Igris from behind, back waist lock, Sky. Able to work him off, and now Sky rolls him up from behind. Sky, jackknife cover. Igris's foot is in the ropes. The referee doesn't see it. Sky has rolled him over, and Ulysses Sky wins the match. Ulysses Sky steals the match from Igris with the jackknife cover near the ropes. Can you believe that from Ulysses Sky? Just when you thought he couldn't get any craftier or any dirtier, Ulysses Sky. Rolls up Igris, jackknifes him into the ropes and turns his body so the referee can't see what's going on. Ulysses Sky has positively stolen a win here from Igris. Let's take another look. Back waist lock from Igris and Sky from the other side. Sky rolling jackknife cover and you can see that Igris's foot is clearly in the ropes. Sky doesn't care and now look at this. Santonico has come out to the top of the ramp. Santonico is here in Atlanta to confront the man who beat him up just a couple days ago. The fact that he's still recovered. Igris from behind. Igris has lifted Sky up. Igris, Sky's up on the shoulders. Reapers embrace. Igris not happy about what Sky did. Santonico not happy about what Sky did. And that ends up with Ulysses Sky left laying in the middle of the ring. Igris is incensed, and Santonico didn't have to lay a hand on Ulysses Sky, but he got what he wanted. Yeah. Matt Hardy has become somewhat of a regular here in Atlanta. We finally gotten everyone cleared from the ring after that whole situation with Santonico, Igris, and Ulysses Sky. I gotta say, it's at least nice to see that Sky is gonna get some payback for what he did to Santonico, even if Santonico isn't the one doing it. 
It's rare to see Igris acting that emotionally, though. Even after a loss. I mean, he's lost 10 previous matches before that. Never reacted like that. So, I don't know. We'll have to see what the fallout is. Matt Hardy, former Intercontinental Champion, trying to get back into the swing of things here on GAW Dark. And we say it all the time when we see Matt Hardy that he's trying to get back to what we... He's trying to get back to the form that we've seen him in before. I think everyone's just glad that he's not part of the Alpha organization anymore. But I think for Matt Hardy, you know, that's all well and good that he's not doing that kind of stuff. But you got to think that he's pining for the days when he was champion, when he got to hold the white strap. Well, not only is he pining for those days, he's pining for the days when he didn't have to fight the bastard. Or fight men like Shelton Benjamin. The last time we saw Matt Hardy here on GAW Dark, he was facing the bastard pack, who we now know has laid down a challenge for the Intercontinental Championship. Now, He's got to come in and face Shelton Benjamin, the man who's responsible for bringing Brock Lesnar and Paul Heyman into GAW. Shelton Benjamin now, as we know, is getting himself a world title shot next week, or I should say next Friday, just a couple days from now on Friday Night Storm. So this is a bit of a tune-up match for him. I don't think Matt Hardy wants anything to do with this, nor would I given the fact that Shelton Benjamin in just 72 hours could be world champion, but Hardy starts things off with a DDT. You can hear the fans solidly behind Matt Hardy as they so often are. Hardy going for the leg. Nice leg pick there on Benjamin. Hardy knows that he's got to be able to shut down the athletic skill of Shelton Benjamin. I'm curious to see what, what Benjamin is going to do when he faces Brock Lesnar. What strategies he's going, is he going to employ against the Beast? And the fact that Lesnar is putting his world title on the line for a second time since winning it at Northern Lights less than a month ago is incredible. So what is Shelton Benjamin gonna come in gonna come in with? How is he going to approach dealing with Brock Lesnar, his friend, a man who he helped train to become a pro wrestler? We'll have to see. Maybe we'll get some insight in this match, seeing how he deals with a former champion in Matt Hardy. Super kick from Shelton Benjamin at sidestepped by Hardy, and now Hardy into the reverse. Oh, neck breaker, never mind. Hardy obviously is going to come in with a much different set of offense than Brock Lesnar. Side effect, though, from Hardy. That could be as dangerous as anything Brock can bring to the table. Let's see if Benjamin can shake that off. Hardy, boot to the gut, twist of fate. And Shelton Benjamin really going to be tested here by the former Intercontinental Champion. Hardy hooks the leg. No! Benjamin kicks out. Well, I think if you'd ask Shelton Benjamin, this is exactly what he needed from this match. He needed to be tested. The twist of fate, that is one, what do you think? Hundreds of matches in the past. And Shelton Benjamin survived it there. So now let's see what Benjamin has. He's got some strength, as we know. Benjamin has always had an incredible combination of strength and athleticism. We're seeing it here now as he's just tossing Matt Hardy around. Just using his body. And now Benjamin with a super kick. Unleashes on Matt Hardy. Benjamin's first huge impactful offensive move of the day could end the day for Matt Hardy. And it does. Maybe that's a clue into what Benjamin is going to bring to Brock Lesnar. Maybe he knows he's not going to be able to get a whole lot in against the Beast. So each move, each attack has to be the strongest one that he can possibly muster, and he's gonna have to survive a lot of punishment. Well, that's what he did in this match. He was not pushing the pace. He was letting Matt Hardy bring the attack to him, so maybe that's what we're gonna see against Brock Lesnar. 
Is it smart to put yourself in a position to eat a lot of offense against the Beast, especially with the World Championship on the line? That I do not know. But what I do know is Shelton Benjamin looks to be in prime form. And in just 72 hours, this man might be GAW World Champion. Make sure you tune in on Friday Night Storm to find out. But coming up next, Derek Cole is backstage, and Derek Cole, he is meeting with, whoa. I mean, I just, folks, we gotta go backstage. Yeah, man, I wanna introduce you all to Sean Alexander and Jacob Ace. Pretty bad deal. These are two of the young stars that I helped shape into some of the best professional wrestlers you have ever seen. The Las Vegas Connection is on a takeover, baby, led by primetime, but it's about more than just me. It's about boys like this who can find a home in the GAW Academy and dominate these wannabes. Show up and show out. That's what the underground is all about. So, gentlemen, I've told you what you can expect out there. You know what the GAW Academy is capable of. You'll see all that soon. Right now, though, Woods Club is waiting out there for you. I'm telling you, those guys ain't shit. I don't want you out there longer than six minutes. You got me? Make LVC proud, baby. From the ashes, wings on my back, stay dead like a matchstick. We ain't coming back, I swear. Just let go and see what happens, gotta let go to see the magic happen. They got us a quick change, so we like a in face. I just bought a new watch, time to make my wrist ring. The zero gravity. Folks, this is completely unexpected. Pretty bad deal. Coming out here, I mean, this is, wow. Sean Alexander on the right, Jacob Ace on the left. And this is completely unexpected. We know that these guys have spent time with the Las Vegas connection on the underground scene, but to see them here in GAW, wow. I mean, this is really something. Derek Cole, making big moves here in general admission wrestling with pretty bad deal. This, I was not prepared for this at all. So unfortunately, I haven't, we, we don't have any of the normal material that we'd be able to give you and talk about the history of Sean, Ale of, uh, Sean Alexander and, and Jacob Ace. But let's see what they can do here against Woods Club. And again, Woods Club is just in a bad position of taking on a team like this, new to GAW with absolutely no knowledge. Woods Club has no knowledge of these guys whatsoever. At least I don't think they do. I don't know if these two teams met in the underground at all, but Seth Woods immediately getting things started right for the Woods Club. Working here against Sean Alexander and a spine buster, good Lord. Here's what I do know about these two guys. I know that they are, first and foremost, incredible athletes. It's part of the reason why Derek Cole was so insistent on bringing them in, I assume. Look at that corkscrew kick. So these guys just bringing in this incredible athletic prowess, great speed. Both these guys, incredible leapers as well, so if you watch any of their matches on the underground. I mean, it's just easy to tell. Nice single arm takedown into the STF from, or the modified STF. More of a cross face here from Alexander trying to get Seth Woods to tap out early on in this match. And Woods able to reverse that one. Another corkscrew kick. Woods sidesteps that. Another one. Woods sidesteps it again. But you can just see the pace that these guys work with. Endless cardio, tremendous athleticism. Seth Woods spinning heel kick. Nice catch and a takedown. Now you just see what these guys are all about. Up on the shoulders goes Woods and Alexander with a Death Valley driver. Rolls over. Oh, Alexander, look at the strength. He picked him up for it once again. Another Death Valley driver. Alexander just letting Seth Woods have it in pretty bad deal. Look at this, look at what they're trying to do. No. Lance Woods is there to break things up and Alexander just runs him through. Super kick to the knee while he was being held by Jacob Ace. Ace and Alexander, they work so well together. Incredible teamwork and now Seth Woods 
He's got himself in a bad two-on-one situation here as Alexander off the ropes. Alexander with a Tiger faint kick. Look at the look at the velocity that he hit Seth Woods with him. He sent him all the way across the ring. And now Alexander ripcord Lariat. Wow. I mean, color me impressed. Derek Cole knows his guys. And he brought pretty bad deal in here for a reason. Tag in. Here comes Jacob Ace. Up onto the top. Alexander. Brain buster. Ace off the top of the frog splash. Man, these guys are good. Ace into the cover. Lance Woods is up. Referee was slow to make the count. And Lance Woods gets him with a fist on the back. Breaks up the cover as well. And now Lance Woods on the wrong end of a double attack by Pretty Bad Deal. This has been a dominating performance by PBD, brought in by Derek Cole and the Las Vegas Connection. What a compliment this is to Marco Diaz, the first man brought in as part of, as part of the LVC. Now Ace just going to town on the head of Seth Woods. My God. Jacob Ace setting up for it. Ace with a super kick, it's caught by Woods. Well, at least he had the ability to see that one coming, but Ace back into the corner goes Woods, and Ace with a splash. Seth Woods just trying to get over and tag in to his brother Lance, and Stan goes for the kitchen sink on Jacob Ace. If I'm Seth Woods, I'm getting a tag in right now. He needs some support in a bad way, but Ace again with a takedown and a spear. I'm just marveling at how well Derek Cole scouts the underground. I mean, look who he's brought in. Look what these two men are capable of doing. And all I got to say is, I just, I think we're going to learn more about these guys as we go. Wow. He saw Matt Hardy come into the ring. Twist of fate, but with the stunner variation. And now Jacob Ace, look at this, turns him over. Ace into a tequila sunrise. And look at him sit back on that. Apparently, he's been watching the Usos too. Who has it? Seth Woods taps out. Jacob Ace with a tequila, with a tequila sunrise. And pretty bad deal. Dominate the Woods Club. For six minutes, they did not allow a tag. We saw everything from them. Corkscrew kick, the Brain Buster combination, the Brain Buster Frog Splash combination, two Death Valley drivers. Here's a look at that Brain Buster Frog Splash combination. Seth Woods had to be bailed out by his brother Lance twice, and yet Jacob Ace, look at that. Modified Stunner, Tequila Sunrise, and Pretty Bad Deal, courtesy of the Las Vegas Connection, are here in general admission wrestling. And what a moment. I was not expecting this at all. But Derek Cole pulls the strings once again. He's brought in Marco Diaz, and now he's brought in Pretty Bad Deal. The Las Vegas connection grows by the day, and it is continuing to look as dangerous as any faction I have ever seen. the world I can't help that I need it all the prima donna life I cannot get over seeing pretty bad deal out here folks so unexpected and Derek Cole has done it again but I'm gonna have to get over it because Caitlin Dunlap is back we saw her make her return to the ring on uh, Storm Chaser of course she and Ulysses Sky Come back. <laughs> that that pyro gets me every time, folks. I gotta say, it gets me every time. So we saw Caitlyn Dunlap a couple weeks ago on Storm Chaser make her in-ring return. Well, she uh, she is back, and she has agreed to face one of her most vicious opponents. One of the one of the reasons actually why Caitlyn Dunlap was gone for so long. An injury sustained in a match with this woman. So Caitlin Dunlap, she wants revenge here today.
Katana, the Japanese sword, of course, upset Caitlin Dunlap in a match, in a couple matches, actually, which led to a steel cage affair between these two, during which Caitlin Dunlap was injured, forced to miss several months of action, but returned here apparently better than ever with the support of Ulysses Sky. Now, what's interesting is, even though there's clear support between the two, the, uh, the funny part is we haven't actually seen them interact with each other. So there's clearly a connection between them. They train together, we know that, but they're not out in each other's matches. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm curious what the uh, what the real connection between Caitlyn Dunlap and Ulysses Sky is. Not that Ulysses Sky would be out here after having gotten the Reapers embrace just a few minutes ago. Let's see if Caitlyn Dunlap can get some revenge here. Katana obviously looking for a victory, trying to get herself back into her winning ways, her three and five record, betrayed by a recent losing streak from Katana, who also is dealing with a couple injuries sustained in her matches with Caitlin Dunlap. Let's see what Dunlap has here. Yeah, we know how good Caitlin Dunlap really is. We know what she's capable of doing. We've seen her do it on countless occasions, but we also know, and Katana knows this as well as anyone, that Dunlap, a bit of a hothead, definitely liable to, you know, fly off the handle and make mistakes. And that's exactly what Katana has taken advantage of in the past. She's not making mistakes here, though, as Caitlin Dunlap hits the superiority. Katana trying to answer back with the jawbreaker, and now Katana gut wrench suplex. Katana, of course, got the better of Caitlyn Dunlap because she caught Dunlap being arrogant, taking her eye off the ball, as it were. Able to small package her and win. We'll see if Caitlyn Dunlap has matured at all. Let's see if she can avoid something like that. We'll have to see. Dunlap up into the pile. Driver on, Kat, on Katana. Oh, that's certainly not something we've seen from Caitlin Dunlap in the past, but here's something that we have seen from her. Caitlin Dunlap, kiss my boot. She makes you do it too. Absolutely disgusting. Leg hook. No, Katana kicks out. Dunlap, she's right back in that place, isn't she? Right back in the place she didn't want to be in with Katana showing her toughness. And now Katana, oh, arm hook DDT. For Caitlin Dunlap, this has to be the worst case scenario. Right back in the place she didn't want to be in. Katana kicking out of the kiss my boot. And now Katana able to use her experience and toughness here against the younger, arrogant Caitlin Dunlap. Let's see if Dunlap is able to deal with it this time. We know she's had issues in the past. Dunlap swings Katana around in a neck breaker. Working on the head and neck. Oh, Katana baited her in once again. Caitlin Dunlap caught again by the wily veteran. This is crunch time here for Caitlin Dunlap. This is where we will get to see how much she has really learned, how much she has really improved after being injured for so long. Has Ulysses Sky made her better? Is she truly better now than she was months ago when we last saw her? This is where we are going to figure it out right now. Let's see if Katana can try to take advantage of Caitlin Dunlap on the outside. Once again, this has all the hallmarks of what we've seen from Dunlap before, going to the outside, taking too much time, being too overconfident. Well, let's see how much she's learned. And she does throw Katana right back in the ring when it seemed like, it seemed like Katana was gonna have the advantage. So now, Caitlin Dunlap, can she make it all the way? Elbow drop and Katana out of the way. No one home as Caitlin Dunlap hits the ground for the elbow drop and now into the corner she goes. Dunlap, nice, educated elbow to get out of there. Call her an elbow, and Katana pushes her away. Superior strength there, but Dunlap, Northern Lights suplex. Katana's leg caught the bottom turnbuckle as well, and Caitlin Dunlap, this is the kind of thing, is she doing it 
to get into the head of Katana, or is she doing it to psych herself up? We'll have to see. Dunlap now pushing the pace, and Dunlap with a face breaker. Beautifully done from Caitlyn, but Katana again has another answer for it. Now, I think when I saw this match on paper, I knew that it was not going to be a straightforward affair. I knew that Katana was going to give her some issues. Dunlap turns away the drop kick. I knew. Oh, Katana baited her in again. K K just Caitlyn Dunlap giving her too much time, and Katana. Baiting her in, and now this time it was Caitlin Dunlap who baited Katana in a little bit. Nice takedown to answer. Dunlap just cannot get a flow here with Katana. Just continuing to keep her on her toes. Reversing at the right time, and now Dunlap to her feet. Katana has the arm. Dunlap answers. Big right forearm strike. Irish whip, Katana over the ropes and now Dunlap beats her on the other side and a DDT on the apron stands her up we know Dunlap is capable of being fantastically brutal at times and Katana this time wants nothing to do with Caitlin Dunlap on the outside Dunlap tried to reach across and Katana huge right hand shot Katana gonna get the better of Dunlap here now, if you ask me, this is exactly what Caitlin Dunlap needed. Katana actually stands her up, and Dunlap just staggered from that right-hand shot. Katana going to meet her on the outside, but now Dunlap baited her in a little bit. Katana caught her. Katana not going to be patient with Dunlap here. Six minutes gone in this 10-minute time limit match. Katana making Caitlin Dunlap work the way we knew she would. Nice takedown, and now back into the ring she goes. Dunlap meets her. Dunlap right into her face, and Katana taunting the young, arrogant wrestler, and Dunlap. She just hits her with a pile driver. Yeah, you want to taunt me, she says. Here's what you get. Into the middle of the ring, Dunlap for the second time today. Superiority. Driving the knees into the gut of Katana. Dunlap, leg hooks. Katana will not kick out of this one. And Dunlap, she was pushed to her limit in this match. But maybe on some subconscious level, that's exactly what she needed. And maybe she knows that's what she needed. In the past, I believe Caitlin Dunlap would not have won a match like this. I think Katana would have come out on top in this sort of affair. But Caitlin Dunlap has clearly improved in her time away. There's no doubt that Dunlap is better now than she was before she got hurt. And that's all that you can ask for when you're rehabbing from an injury. How much does the association with Ulysses Sky have to do with that? I don't know. Maybe we'll come to find out what that association really means. What it, how those two benefit. All I do know is Caitlin Dunlap, I think, I think I'm ready to say that she is once again one of the most dangerous women in GAW. Atlanta today seems to be all about wrestlers either coming here and showing how good they are or returning to form. And Pete Dunn hopes to become part of that ladder category here. Pete Dunn, I mean, we say it all the time. This is this man who has had so much success in his singles career in the past. But it has not translated to success in GAW, at least not in the singles ranks. So for Pete Dunn, every opportunity here in Atlanta is an opportunity for him to ascend to that level, to get to that singles level that he has been at before. But I will say this, as good as Pete Dunne is, as great as we know he is in the ring, his opponent tonight is, well, he's on, he's on quite a run. And he is maybe the most dangerous man in the world. Pete Dunne would take exception to that.
But I'll tell you this. I don't know if there's anyone in the world more dangerous right now than Pac. We saw Pac last Friday challenge Bandito for the Intercontinental title. He said that his goal is not just to win championships, it's not just for glory, but it is to hurt men, and that's what he wants to do to Bandito. So this Friday, are we going to get a response from the Intercontinental Champion? I certainly hope so. I believe that Bandito and Rey Mysterio will be at Friday Night Storm, and we know that Mysterio had said to Bandito that he was going to be in the crosshairs, that everyone was going to want a piece of him. So, does that mean that he will jump into and accept Pac's challenge, knowing how dangerous Pac is, knowing that Pac, the former world champion, looks to be in the best shape that he's been since winning that title? Something tells me that Bandito, none of that really bothers him. Let's see if Pac's performance here tonight does. This is a great opportunity for Pac to show Bandito exactly what he's about. He's not going to do it there. Basement drop kick and Pete Dunn. He's letting him know, you're not going to take me down with that kind of stuff. Well, Pac, you're going to take him down with a snapmare. Grounded, top wrist lock. Pac trying to beat Pete Dunn at his own game, apparently. We know that Dunn is a master of joint manipulation. We know all the stuff he does. Pac just... <laughs> He's trying to beat him at that. And I respect it. Pack is a man of great pride, and Dunn sends him over. Nice job by Pack to hang on to the top rope there. And Pete Dunn looked like he was winding up for a big strike. Pack not going to let him do it. Instead, Irish whip into the corner. Dunn! Kick to the gut. And for Pete Dunn, on, uh, you know, on the other hand, as much as Pack has to prove right now, if Pete Dunn is going to get a win over the Bastard after Pac had challenged Bandito, had laid down the challenge for Bandito, certainly you'd have to think, oh, springboard moonsault from Pac. My God, is Pac an incredible athlete. Two count, Pete Dunn kicks out. I right, so you gotta believe if Pete Dunn does get a win here, then Dunn could certainly insert himself in that conversation to potentially challenge Bandito, and that's really all he wants. Pack rolls out of the ring. Dunn tries to meet him. Pack is waiting for him there. And Pack wants nothing to do with Pete Dunn on the outside. This is what we come to expect from Pack. Very serious. All business. Now up to the top he goes. Pack shooting star press. Pete Dunn got the knees up. I think Pack. Obviously, his initial thought would be to go for the Black Arrow, but you're seeing him develop his game a lot more. Nice takedown from Pac into the Fujiwara armbar. Again, just trying to beat Pete Dunn at his own game. As good at submissions as Pac is, we know that Dunn, one of the most prolific submission wrestlers in the world, and you can see it by the way he gets out of that armbar into the head scissors takedown. Well done. No pun intended there from the bruiserweight, but Pac immediately gets on top and a thrust kick. Pete Dunn did not see that coming, but back up onto his feet he goes. Irish whip into the corner, Dunn, another flying kick. Dunn has survived longer than most of Pac's opponents, it must be said. But actually, that would, uh, that would make sense, given what we've seen from Pac in the past, that normally, up until this past few months, Pac has liked to keep matches short. He has turned up the pace, he has tried to run through opponents quickly, and I think what he's learned is that if he is to do that, you know, there's some certain pitfalls to that, and that has hurt him in the past in his career. So he's tried to keep things slow. He's tried to work more into matches. So this is something more than what we've seen from him. Pete Dunn gets him up. Dunn with the bitter end. Well, maybe this match isn't going to go too long, but Pete Dunn rolls Pack over. Dunn into the cover. Pack right there underneath the ropes, but Pack. He chooses to make a statement on Pete Dunn. Kicks out his right shoulder. He didn't even need the ropes. So again, this is what we've seen from Pac in the past. That we've seen him wanting to go longer in matches. And that has certainly happened. 
Dunn. Nice snap, German. So Dunn going to take advantage. Certainly he knows what Pack wants to do here. And Dunn, I think he might want to end this thing. Forearm smash, ducked by Pack. Pack certainly knew what he was doing here. And now Pack with a modified backdrop suplex. Pack with the bridge. Dunn kicks out. Pack. Well, he's not going to let that phase him at all. Going to continue on the attack as we get towards the five minute mark. Coming to the top goes Pete Dunn and Pack. Open hand, palm strike. Pack going to meet him up at the top. Now, this one I'm not going to credit to the Usos. Pack has been doing this for a while. Superplex from the outside. We know that Pack has made heavy use of the superplex in the past couple months. That one to the outside is just more evidence of that. Done. Back to his feet, just trying to stay away from the attack of the bastard. It's not going to work. Pack with a Mishinoku driver. But Dunn right back to his feet. Pete Dunn caught that spike of adrenaline. And now Pete Dunn, he is not too happy about what Pack's done. Introduces him to the top turnbuckle and Pete Dunn in a great position right now against the bastard. Pack, Papa, Hurricane Rana. Yeah, Pack says, I'll see your great position and I'll raise you a brutalizer. Pack locks the brutalizer in. Pete Dunn trying to roll it over. He cannot. Pete Dunn taps out. And the brutalizer remains the most dangerous submission in the world. I think that without a doubt, there is not a hold on God's green earth more dangerous than the brutalizer. If Pac gets it locked in, you are done. And so was Pete done here. Here's another look at Pat kicking out of the bitter end. I don't think Dunn ever really recovered after that. Superplex to the outside, Mishinoku driver, and a brutalizer from the bastard. And he has given Bandito something to think about as Bandito makes his way to the arena on Friday. Does he really want to mess with Pac right now? Does he want to risk his Intercontinental Championship against a man like this? I hope we'll find out on Friday. And something tells me we will. I don't think Bandito is one to make his challengers wait. <laughs> But Bianca Belair is coming off maybe the biggest win of her career when she beat women's world champion Dakota Kai last Friday on Friday Night Storm. Now it must be said that Ronda Rousey had a big part to play in that ordeal as Rousey tripped up Kai, almost allowed Bianca Belair to get, a, to get the win with a backslide. Then when that didn't work, she tripped up Kai coming off the ropes allowed Belair to hit the kiss of death and get the win. So I think Belair, as happy as she must be to get the win over Dakota Kai and certainly assert herself as the number one contender to the Women's World Championship, I think she also knows that she's got something to prove. She has to prove that she really is on the level of the Women's World Champion. And what must Dakota Kai be thinking since then? I know that reports have said Kai is not here in Atlanta. She has gone back to the Team Kick headquarters and she is furious. So what will happen to Ronda Rousey? Kai was, she was mad enough before to put Rousey into a handicap match with Jessamine Duke and Marina Shafir just a couple weeks ago. Duke is back here drawing the assignment against Bianca Belair. So what will Kai do now that Rousey has actually cost her a match and probably found her a challenger to the Women's World Championship? Nice takedown from Duke, but Belair counters her beautifully. Snapmare and Belair, grounded butterfly stretch. I think she wants to show Dakota Kai how strong she is, how dangerous she is, and that that win, no matter how much Ronda Rousey was involved, was not a fluke. And personally, folks, I don't think it was. Rousey did get involved, but Dakota Kai still chose to take her eye off of Bianca Belair, and that could happen to anyone. I think what Belair showed is that 
the KOD is capable of putting down anyone, including the women's world champion. Nice takedown from Jessamine Duke to get back into this match. We've seen it all from Bianca Belair, former US champion. Rosita, of course, cost her that championship, and Belair has moved on brilliantly. Now has the world championship in her sights. Jessamine Duke, nice takedown, and Duke off the ropes. Duke looking for that punt that we've seen her use before. Belair had it scouted. And Belair gonna return to the fold. Up onto the shoulders goes Jessamine Duke. Belair, KOD! It's how she put away Dakota Kai. It's how she won the US Championship. And tonight, it is how she beats Jessamine Duke. So that's a statement made by Bianca Belair. Taking one of the most dangerous mixed martial artists in pro wrestling and putting her to the sword. Duke went for that punt. Belair out of the way. KOD and Belair, I think, sending a message directly to Dakota Kai that my win was not a fluke, she says. So for Kai, has the message been received? We'll have to see, but how will this all shake out? Belair is certainly the number one contender right now to the Women's World Championship, so how is this gonna shake out? Well, you'll have to tune in to Friday Night Storm to find out. Coming up next, though, is our main event, Island Nation in action against one of the Underground's best teams in war. This is This is well, I'll tell you this, I don't want to speculate about what Ward's thinking, but I think I think I can be pretty sure in saying that they are not happy men after losing to the Las Vegas connection just a couple days ago. It was a hellacious match. So the fact that they're even healthy enough to take this match against Island Nation is a shock to me. But the Las Vegas connection, Derek Cole and Marco Diaz came out on top against Vic Cassidy and Isaiah Hannibal. It was a Marco Diaz disconnect that beat uh, Cassidy and got the win for LVC. So war is back. They are pissed off, even more so than usual. And Island Nation may be the very unlucky recipients of a war beating, but Island Nation in their own right has been on an incredible run. Do not count them out of this match. Island Nation, much like Max Ultimate, is really, they've really been made here in Atlanta. This is where the fans have gotten to know them. This is how they've become really successful. And for them, their only two losses have been on Storm Chaser. So they have not lost here in Atlanta. This is their territory. One of those losses on Storm Chaser, by the way, was to war a couple months ago, right after America the Beautiful 2. So this also is a big opportunity for Island Nation to come back, get a win back, and do it in what has become Island Nation territory. You can call the former home of the WCW power plant an island unto itself for these two men. Let's get into our main event. Eddie Tonga to start things off for Island Nation. It'll be Isaiah Hannibal for war and starts things off with a T-bone suplex. It's a smart decision for Hannibal to start things off, I think. He took less punishment in that, uh, in that match with LVC. So it's a smart thing for him to be in here. Let's see if he can get things started against Island Nation. Three straight layers. Eddie Tonga staggers into the corner, and Kobayashi will get the tag in. Smart from Island Nation. Not going to allow any one man to take too much punishment here. Oh, nice back trip and a takedown from Kobayashi. And now Kobayashi going to use his pace. He says, you think you got three lariats? Let me show you this. Power slam. Kobayashi so strong. Graveyard shift. My God, think about what these men are capable of. The strength of Kobayashi. You can, like I said, you can call Atlanta home for Island Nation, and you can tell that the fans really get behind him. This is a completely different team than what we saw go up against War a couple months ago on Storm Chaser. We are looking at a totally different situation, but Hannibal comes back with an Olympic slam. 
Now Hannibal trying to get the fans on his side and they are not responding. No one is going to get the fans on their side when they're facing Island Nation. I think Hannibal might know that. Sends Kobayashi over. Nice job by Kobayashi to stay on, but Hannibal with the right hand sends him off. Eddie Tonga there to play security as well. Make sure nothing happens here. I think uh, Island Nation knows as well as we do that war are maybe liable to do something here knowing they're on a bit of a losing streak. They've got to be frustrated. Into the corner, Hannibal fights his way out of it, but Kobayashi, educated elbow. Forearm, and now Kobayashi going to try to get Hannibal back into a dangerous position in the Island Nation corner. We know that Island Nation excels at these double team maneuvers. Nice takedown. Kobayashi slides around, knocks Vic Cassidy off the apron as well, and they both line it up. Uppercut. Swing kick combination. Hannibal tries to roll out of the way of Eddie Tonga. That's not going to happen. Tonga hauls off with a couple of big lariats. Hannibal tries to answer. Tonga ducks underneath and a third. Man, would you look at these guys. I mean, just unbelievable stuff from Island Nation. They have dominated one of the top underground tag teams. And they have done it with such ease. With all of this fan support, they really are a different team when they come here to Atlanta. I think the only thing stopping Island Nation from ascending to the top, from challenging the Titans, from potentially becoming tag team champions, is whether or not they can do this on a Storm Chaser. Can they do this in front of 15,000? Can they bring this same amount of fire? For me, I don't see why they wouldn't be able to. It's just a matter of getting experience fighting at this level. And with six matches already under their belt in just a matter of months, I think, uh, I think there's no doubt that they are getting that experience. So I think it's a matter of not if, but when for Island Nation. Irish whip into the corner. Hannibal finds himself once again in a dangerous position. Tag in. Here comes Kobayashi. Wheelbarrow. Code breaker. Man, I feel like these guys just every match, they pull out something you've never seen before. It's amazing to watch. Kobayashi grinds him down. Top wrist lock. Hannibal trying to break his way out of it. You don't want to be close to any member of Island Nation knowing what they can do. They've got submissions. They've got strikes. I mean, they really have everything here. Vic Cassidy into the ring. So is Eddie Tonga. Belly to belly suplex. All four men are in the ring. This thing has broken down. Referee chastising Vic Cassidy. And now Isaiah Hannibal brings Kobayashi towards the ropes. Hannibal gets his feet up. Kobayashi could be in trouble. No, power's out. Kobayashi now realizing that he's working two on one. Not that it matters. Kobayashi looking for a belly to belly of his own, but Hannibal breaks the eyes. Kobayashi still staying on top and a Frankensteiner. Would you look at this? Beautifully done. Gets in between Hannibal and Cassidy. Doesn't allow the tag in. This is textbook tag team wrestling from Yamamoto Kobayashi. How good has he been? And with no Eddie Tonga, with no tag support, Kobayashi doing his thing, graveyard shift. Far away from Vic Cassidy as well, into the cover. Cassidy's not going to make it. Yamamoto Kobayashi, would you look at that? All by himself puts away Isaiah Hannibal and War. And this is a completely different performance than what we've seen when Island Nation took on War the first time. The double team offense, cutting the ring in half, preventing tags. This is everything tag wrestling is supposed to be about. And it's everything Island Nation did right in this match. Hannibal tried to cheat. They tried to do everything they could to keep Island Nation away from this victory. None of it worked. And Island Nation, this is, in my opinion, the fastest rising up and coming tag team maybe the best one there is can they beat the titans can they become tag team champions i think it's a solid possibility but only time will tell folks thank you so much for joining us here on gaw dark we will see you on friday for friday night storm when brock lesnar puts his world championship on the line against shelton benjamin thank you so much subscribe so you can see it we appreciate you